Good evening, and welcome to the British American Business Council of New England uh, first bite of our brand new series, um, the Great British American Business Council Cooking Show. We will be uh, tonight chatting with uh, Nick Curlius, who is the executive chef of Rochambeau, uh, Brasserie Joe, and a, a number of other uh, great restaurants in, in the city of Boston uh, and, and around Massachusetts. Uh, he's actually in his home kitchen in uh, New Hampshire tonight, so we will pop in on him shortly. We will then um, hear from uh, the great Brit who is leading Stop and Shop uh, supermarket chain up and down uh, the Northeast and talk with Lauren Dickerson, who is the Vice Consul for Food and Beverage for uh, my organization, the Department for International Trade um, in the United States. We'll then, we'll have a fa fantabulous quiz. You'll be able to uh, compete to win some great prizes, including a $200 gift certificate for Rochambeau Restaurant and some goodie baskets uh, from the Department for International Trade with some really great um, food products uh, to get your, your cravings going. So for those that don't know, the, for those for whom this is the first time at a British American Business Council event, um, the organization has been around for more than 35 years, helping British and American businesses um, make connections, find partners uh, and uh, socialize on both sides of the pond. Um, and we do a number of programs. As I say, this is the first one on this foodie series, uh, but we do programs all about business services. Um, we have one coming up, our next program coming up in April um, will be run by Fragamen, the immigration specialists. Uh, and then we have a green finance program coming up in later April as well. So we will uh, encourage you to go to the website, which is BA bcne.org. Uh, make sure you connect with us on LinkedIn and that way you'll be able to keep up to date with all of the amazing things uh, that is happening in the world of business, uh, transatlantic trade and investment um, and thought leadership around really important topics. Um, so uh, as I say, this session is being recorded so please do keep yourselves on mute. Uh, but I'm now delighted to introduce to you uh, Judy Ackerman, who is on the board of the British American Business Council, and she is going to host our first segment, uh, Beef Wellington, a la Chef Calais. Judy, over to you. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little late, but um, better late than never. So I'm very excited to uh, introduce um, Nick Calius. Uh, of Rochambeau, and he is going to walk us through this wonderful, wonderful preparation for Beef Wellington. Hello. Thank you for having me, Judy, uh, and everyone else. This is a lot of fun. So, yeah, so today we're going to make Beef Wellington, um, an English dish stolen by the French as well. We kind of use it everywhere. Um, so to start, we use beef, uh, beef tenderloin. So we get at your regular butchers, nice center cut. They call it the chateau piece. It's the centerpiece of the beef wellington, of the uh, tenderloin wrap. So we're gonna take that and turn our stove on. Now, if it goes off, I'm sorry. I'm not cooking under my fan. So cast iron pan works great. So we're gonna heat a little, little bit of oil in there. And we're gonna season the tenderloin very, very well. It's very important to do this step probably the day before when making beef wellington. You want everything really, really cold. So when it comes together, it's one cohesive, one cohesive piece of meat, pate, and a lot of love. So we're gonna roll that all in the salt and the pepper. Pan's getting hot. You want to hear that nice sizzle? Don't mess with the meat much. Just let the meat cook. Let it sear on all the sides. So by searing it, you're doing a couple of things. You're starting the cooking process. You're encasing all the juices into the tenderloin. So if you just thin sear it, you put the mushroom duck cell on there and, 
and you wrapped it and you cooked it, you just have boiled meat and pastry. So really, really, really important to meet all the sides and then to look. That's very important too. So what we're gonna do for time for savings, we're gonna put in the freezer. We can jump onto everything else. So Nick, how did you first get interested in cooking? So my dad, when I was young, my parents bought a restaurant when I was about 11 years old. Wow. So I, sorry, a million times. So my dad one day said, hey, do you want to cook or you want to dishwash? I'm like, well, I want to cook. The cool thing to do. So I started cooking, ended up doing both. Um, that's family business. So I've been doing that about 11 years old. Um, and went to culinary school in Boston. Took over my first dollar hotel at 24 and and from there stayed in hotels for 20, 20 plus years. Spent 15 of those at the Colony Hotel in Bradbury Joe in Boston um, as the executive chef and director of food and beverage there. Wonderful hotel. Um, my home, my second home. And then left there a couple of years ago when we closed Bradbury Joe and went to the Lion Group. And there I'm the culinary director. So I act as executive chef for 33 restaurants um, in, in uh, five states. I don't know how you do it. So it looks like someone just asked the question, do you put oil in the pan first? Yeah, so I put a little oil in the pan um, just to coat the bottom. Yep. Um, you want to get to right for a little smoking point. Mm -hmm. I use a blend oil because it has just a little higher heating point. You don't want to use olive oil or anything like that. It's going to burn really quickly. Right. Um, if you don't have peanut allergies, you can add peanut oil if you want to get really high, but not necessary. Just good canola oil, blend oil is fine. You want to stir it all nice and crusted. And from that, we're going to put it in the freezer and let it sit. In the freezer? I'm going to put it in the freezer just because we're going to wrap it today. Oh, right, so right, right. I would put this in the fridge overnight and yep. just let it chill. And then that way we can kind of make everything because we're going to make the duck cell next. So all these components have to be kind of cold. Right. So um, obviously I've made some duck cell and had that ready. So that's what a, a mushroom duck cell looks like. Chopped up mushrooms and shallots and some butter. Um, right. And you want to kind of make that into a little bit of a paste. You want to take most of the liquid out because that's going to go wrap around the foie gras mousse and the, um, the tenderloin. Right. Oh. I use cremini mushrooms or baby fellas, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. Just a little more flavorful than your basic button mushrooms. Right. You have a food processor. You can absolutely do this with a food processor. It takes a lot less time. Huh. Here, we're just going to kind of rough chop these up. You want to get them nice and small. Right. So, Nick, what, what's, the, what's the theory about washing mushrooms or wiping them? Or what's well, the you know, the old theory was you couldn't wash mushrooms because it absorbed liquid. They were wrong. Right. Um, you want to wash your mushrooms because they're, you know, they're filled with dirt. You get mushrooms at the store, they're filled with dirt. So wash them up, let them dry. I washed these. Uh, actually, my, my daughter washed these for me about two hours ago. Yep. And right now, uh, they're not absorbing the liquid. Mushrooms naturally going to have a bunch of liquid in them anyway, some water. So that's going to cook out when we make the duck cell. Right. So I definitely wash them first, throw them in a the strainer, just let them sit there, throw them on a cooling rag, let them dry. Oh, you put them through a strainer. Hmm. You, you, yeah, definitely going to strain them. You want to wash the strainer. You really just rinse them off. You get out there. And sometimes when I was in school, we would brush them. And I will say when I was a younger chef in the hotel and, and people did some things wrong, I'd give them five cases of mushrooms and a little brush and tell them to go brush mushrooms for about three hours. Great punishment back in the day. I have a little mushroom brush myself. <laughs> yeah, they're great. Uh, so either one really works. Right. It's a nice little coarse mushroom. Right. So you want the mushroom to be nice and coarse. Okay, yeah. Now we're just going to heat up our cast on again. I have the oil in here already from the beef. Right. Residual right. beef right here. So I'm just going to add the mushrooms to that. Right. So that adds to the flavor, obviously. So that's going to add a little extra flavor that it's already cooked the beef in. Right. Then we're going to add a little shallot to it. Mm -hmm. So I take one shallot. And dice it up. So, Nick, is this is this the the premier 
uh, food item that most people want to order when they go out for to a fine restaurant? When people order beef wellington, it's usually a special occasion. Right. For this, I'm also going to add a little butter. We have some lovely uh, goat's butter I'm going to add. Wow. Goat's a butter. A little butter in there. Yep. Also going to add a little bit of fresh thyme. Mm -hmm. This as well. Yep. Then always salt and pepper. Mm-hmm. We're going to let that cook. Yeah, beef wellington is one of those things. I know I make it for my family every Christmas. That's our Christmas. Right. It's one of those, you know, occasion things you want to go to at the restaurants of Brazil Joe. We run it on a one night a week. We mushroom duck salad, uh, beef Wellington rather. Wow. Uh, what night is that? What night is that, Nick? That was at Brazil Joe. Oh, uh, but and for, um, I actually made these for takeout during the pandemic. Um, you know, we try to do with the restaurants that we have everything we could during the pandemic because it's been a tough year. Um, but once the holidays came, we stopped putting to-go package together. So my Christmas package was a beef wellington. Um, wow. You buy beef wellington, I'd make it all, all tasty up and have it all ready to go. Right. And you just make it at home. So 33 of them for Christmas. Oh so, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, a lot of rolling. So Nick, if you don't have uh, shallots, can you use onions? Yeah, I would use a red onion if you don't have shallots. White onions just aren't gonna be sweet enough. So a red onion is going to give you that same potency of a shallot. Oh, good. So, okay. that. Yep. I also like to put a little bit of garlic in mine. Oh, now you're talking. <laughs> I think you put it more towards the end. Right. But otherwise, it's just going to really burn. Yeah. Uh, we're just going to pull this off. Now, the mushroom duck cell, you don't want this to cook until all the liquid is gone out of it. So it's a really kind of a paste. And wow. you end up with, with mushrooms that look like this. It's Yummy. you can see it's a little it right. sticks together really well. And when we roll the beef wellington, it's gonna help it over here to the pastry into the meat. So that's those that's that part. So Nick, I think you were saying that um, due to the pandemic, yes, um, a lot of what you've been doing is takeout for people. The article in we've been doing a lot of takeout during the pandemic to try to you know keep people working. Uh, unfortunately, when the pandemic started, we had to lay off 2,500 people um, in our restaurants. No. Yeah. So um, it's been a year. It really has. We kept three restaurants open, and we were doing takeout in uh, Summer Shack in Cambridge, um, Nino in Burlington, and Harvard Gardens. We did a lot of good. We um, fed frontline workers every week for about three months. I served, I think I made personally made 3,000 lunches. Um, for frontline workers that we donated, and we did that through Summer Shack as well, um, as um, through Nino to try to do what we can because we all know we're all in the same boat. So right. we're slowly bringing people back, and um, it's it's happy to say that the restaurants are coming back, and seating's opening up, the patios are opening up, and you know we have all of our we have 32 out of the 33 restaurants open now. So wow, fabulous! Coming back. I remember when you prepared. Um, the annual dinner for La Dame de Scuffier with eight- Oh, that was my memory today on Facebook, actually. <laughs> Here, the pictures that came up. I know, eight courses and wine pairings. And Nick did that actually two years in a row and each year it was different and it was absolutely fabulous. And between yours, I did the, uh, the men. <laughs> All right, yeah. Men tied me in too. So here we have some puff pastry. Yep. Basic, simple puff pastry by any at the store. Um, I always like to buy uh, one of the grocery stores down the street. Have um, it's defrosted. It's a soft one, which is great. You can buy the Pillsbury or whatever you know flavor kind you want. Right. Um, can you grab a pate out of the fridge? There should be a little square pate in the middle and an egg. My wife's gonna act as my sous chef. That's good. So Nick, someone is asking the question, question um, if you have a recipe and instructions and can you share that with us? Uh, absolutely, I will email them to you tomorrow when I get back to work. Okay. Then we can, um, we can send them up. So I did buy a little um, foie gras pate at the store. I live in New Hampshire, 
kind of hard. I was actually surprised I found this. It was kind of hard to find a foie gras in New Hampshire. But right. there's a great butcher shop nearby, and they had a foie gras pate. So any kind of pate, you don't have to use pate. Um, a lot of time they'll put mustard on the right. beef itself and then wrap that mushroom and then the ham and then the pastry and do all that and just skip the pate altogether. Classically, right. the mushroom is the pate and it's the pastry. We're yeah. going to be running that with also some prosciutto to help yeah. the moisture from the mushrooms and everything else. So it keeps the pastry dry. Right. That's interesting. So, so Nick, you yeah. also could have introduced Jean, by the way, when she was walking around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nick also been is. For the last 30, 31 years, 30 years. Married 23. Nick. Nick yeah, also has three. Hi, Jean. <laughs> she also he also has three kids, and a cute dog. What's that? You also have three kids and a cute dog. I do, I do, I do. One child in college, one going to college, and my youngest loves to cook with me and bake, and it's uh, it's, it's good and it's bad. It's scary because I'm a chef. And I, you know, I want my kids to do something different, but it's great because she likes to do what I do. So that's great. Basketball, she cooks, it's just her child. So we have the pastry we all set. We're gonna take the beef out. Okay, so beef is nice and cold. Yep. So we'll put this to the side. And here I have some prosciutto that I put on plastic wrap. Right. Okay, Nick, someone is asking a question. You're rolling out the pastry, so, if it, so it will fit or because it affects how long you bake it? Well, I love the pastry for a couple of reasons. I don't want it too thick because I don't want to expand on that all that much. Um, right. But I also want to make sure I have, it's big enough for the tenderloin. I will, you'll see, I will be trimming some and things like that too. Right, right. But I always like to roll it because otherwise you end up with the pastry about that thick. I kind of like it about... So you know a pastry probably about a little more than a quarter of an inch. I like it maybe the sixteenth inch or so, a little smaller. Okay. Okay, so we I, I put it in plastic wrap for a couple of reasons. I'm going to use the plastic wrap also to tighten the Wellington up. Oh. You, like if you ever made a compound butter at home or you're making anything at home, you really want to tie it tight. So. We have it spread out. What you probably do is take the beef, make sure it fits. It fits great. So I'm gonna take the mushroom, duck cell. I'm gonna put the duck cell on the ham. Yep. You can use any kind of ham. Uh, it'd be great if you want to kind of change it up. You can use speck, which is like more of a spoke prosciutto, which would be kind of a different flavor, which would be kind of cool. Um, right. It's really any kind of cured ham you want. Um, when I was at Brasserie Joe, Chef Joho, was from Alsace, France. He liked to use crepe instead of ham. He didn't want to add the saltiness or anything like that to it, so he liked to put a crepe down instead. Really, a crepe, huh? Yeah, we would make some unsweetened crepes, so we don't want it to be sweet, obviously. It doesn't seem like it would have as much flavor as the bruschetta. And it doesn't. It, it, it's very, it's, you know, I've never told Joe this because I love him, but it's kind of bland. Right, right. <laughs> so I would. Uh, so the ham acts a little, actually adds a little saltiness to it. So once you kind of spread that over the mushroom mixture, like so. Right. And now I'm gonna take, take my knife. Open up the pate. So someone had a question. If you choose to use mustard instead of pate, yep. what type? Personally, I like Dijon. Uh, yes. I like spicy kick to it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of chefs like to use um, just yellow mustard. You can use a, a, a good ground brown mustard would work out well too. Personally, I'm a Dijon guy. I like that extra spice to it. Right. So now I'm going to take the, the mousse. I'll show you in a second. We have the mousse here. We're just going to kind of Put it all the way down on the meat. Oh, interesting. You want to kind of just dress the whole thing like you're decorating a cake almost. Right. So what that mousse is going to do too is going to help the mushrooms to stick to the um, to the fillet. 
Hmm. So it's kind of, it acts a couple of things. It adds a lot of flavor. This right. uh, foie gras mousse was cooked in um, port wine. So if you uh, had foie gras at home, you could take, just take the foie gras and you would saute foie gras with some brandy and some cognac, uh, some anac and some onions, some herbs, some, and just kind of saute it all. And you just till it's done. And then you put it right into a blender with some um, butter. You can make a mousse, let it sit. That'll be the same thing. You can do chicken liver if you like. Mm. So this one, we got the meat. We put the meat in the middle. Yep. Gonna roll. Mm. And then, why the plaster record is important, you're gonna tie it like this, so it's nice, tight little ball. And that is going to, what's going to get rolled into your puff pastry. So typically I would take this and I would make this the day before as well. So this is almost like a three day process for me. Mm -hmm. I would sit, I would make my duck cell. I would refrigerate that off overnight. The next day I would come in, I would wrap the ham, the duck cell, the pate, and then I would put that all together like this. And I would put that in the fridge overnight. And then I would make the puff pastry. I would wrap it. That can sit overnight as well. So this could be a long process. Not something you typically would do in one day. Right, right. That's what makes beef Wellington so special too for me. So basically it's just rolling it several times and that yep. keeps it tight so it doesn't unravel. Right, you're just rolling it and you're getting it tight and you're, and you're twisting it, you're twisting one way and the other way as you're rolling. Right. It really makes a tight little ball. Right, right. So if you see that, it's really, really tight. You get the air out of there. You just let that sit. And that's just going to settle and it's going to solidify mm -hmm. the, fat the, um, the fat from the mushroom that's in the mushroom, the fat from the foie gras, the fat from the meat. Everything's going to kind of stick together and make this so this doesn't move. Yes, yeah, so almost like a sushi roll without the seaweed. <laughs> All right. So we're going to obviously, we don't have three days. We're going to unwrap it. Yep. We have that there. All right, so we have our egg. Okay, so now we're gonna put the Wellington right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Brush around all the sides. Hmm. This is where kind of the fancy stuff comes in, which is kind of cool. So we're gonna wrap it over. Right. I'm gonna get nice and tight. You wanna kind of get the air out of it a little bit. So you can have extra, which is fine. We're just gonna cut the extra off. We don't need all that extra. And then we're gonna egg wash the bottom little end pieces. We're gonna bring them up and over. Kind of like so. Yep. Okay. Now from there, we take extra puff pastry. And I guess it's just a small, I got one already done, but you take a lattice cutter. Oh. Add it to huh. the store. You kind so of make a, Oh, I see. I didn't even know they had lattice rollers. Oh yeah. And then you can see. Wow. Lattice work. So Very nice. We're going to take our Wellington here. We're going to take our sheet pan. Mm -hmm. This part, I do this part right on the sheet pan. Yep. So, um, parchment paper down or any kind of non stick pad or anything like that. You're going to egg wash the Wellington again. Wow. You're going to have your oven preset ready to go about 375. Mm -hmm. And this will take. This one here will take probably about 30 minutes or so. 
You want the temperature about, about 115 to 118 and let it sit. So I made this one earlier. Wow. That one right on top. So I'm curious if it only takes that long to cook. I'm surprised that the beef gets cooked. Well, it does. Well, you started the cooking process already. So it's encased in the pastry. So it's almost roasting and steaming and all that stuff at the same time. It cooks pretty quickly. Right, right. You have to be so careful that you don't burn the pastry either. Yes. So we're going to kind of trim off our edges a little bit. Oh, someone wants to know the name of the roller and where you get that cool thing. It's a, it's a lattice cutter. Um, Amazon, any kind of, really, any kind of pastry store, cooking store, anything like that. But it adds a nice little, as you can wow. see, it adds a nice little texture to the uh, oh, wow. So then we're going to take our egg wash. Again, yep. we're going to reapply. Well, I can see why this is an expensive dish when you have it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's labor intensive. I mean, I spent four days making them for the to-go orders. And, you know, my other chefs are like, you doing anything else? I'm like, nope. Wow. Wellington. Okay, so now I'm going to spend a little time over the whole thing. Ah, interesting. Yep. Now, where did you put the <laughs> little finishing I, salt? Okay, I didn't see you put salt. I didn't see you put salt and pepper on previously. Is this the only salt you're using? Well, the salt on the beef and the salt in the mushrooms. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. I'm gonna just finish it with a little more salt on top. Yep. Okay. So just here, finished product looks like that. Mmm. Yeah. I'll go in the oven for about thirty minutes. Or so you want to check, keep checking it. You know, with a digital meat thermometer. Right. Um, Digital is better than the, the other ones. The other ones you get to calibrate all the time. Digital, you don't. So you always want to keep checking it to make sure that the temperature is about, like I said, what's it about 114 or so? You want to stop, let it rest. It's going to get to about 118, 120, 122. And for me, that's perfect temperature. Some people like more. My whole feeling is if you're going to cook meat well done, then uh, have chicken. Right. Okay. So I guess we're going to come back to you after it cooks. Excellent. <laughs> So I assume this is when we take a, a little shift. Um, so let me ask, someone else has a question. How would you heat up the Wellington to go? The Wellington go to order. I don't understand, but anyway. Well, so when I, I sold them to go, yeah. I would to that stage, just like that. And okay. I would send instructions. Um, so that's what we would do when we sell them to go. Um, right. To get that and to like heat the next day, it's not going to be the same. That's one of those dishes that you cook. And you dump it and you eat it. That's it. Right. So let me ask you. So I assume you make gravy to go with this too? Yes. 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 Actually, yes. Let's do that right now. What am I burning? Up? So a couple of little side parts that go with the beef Wellington. We have a sauce, a red wine sauce. Want to bring some red wine in? Right. Yep. So we're gonna start that off with some shallots that we're gonna just quickly julienne. Yep. So obviously you won't have the juices from the meat to go into the. Right. So I use uh, I use demi glaze. Demi glaze. Okay. I put a little oil in the pan. Then I'm add my shallots. I'm going to add a little bit of garlic right. as well. And then again, I'm going to add some thyme because I'm a big time. Right. And where do you get, where do you get the demi glaze? I've never bought that. You know what? I was we you know the restaurants we make it, um, but no one has that time. It takes three days to make demi glaze. Right. But I found a butcher, a local butcher actually, right to me that actually sells demi glaze by the court. So wow. I get you back there. It's the only place I can find it. So a lot of butchers will have that. Um, it's a great thing to have. You can buy it, you throw it in the freezer and you forget about it. You can buy it online, I believe too. And I just have chicken demi and I have veal demi in my freezer. Okay. It's great for everything. Right. So that's cooking, right? So the uh, shallots and the garlic are caramelizing with the fat and the oil. Um, we're going to glaze that with red wine. See? Red wine. My wife bringing red wine lower. She um, was right there a minute ago with the red wine, yes. 
Ano, ano ang hand? <laughs> so Nick, you make three of these at Christmas time? At Christmas time, I made 30 of these, yeah. Oh, 30. I made 30 of these at Christmas. So now I'm gonna add red wine. Right. Probably about, I, I used a half a shallot, I used a tablespoon of garlic, and I would say probably three ounces of red wine, four ounces of red wine. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to let the red wine reduce a little bit. And then I'm going to add my demi-glace. The demi-glace, again, is just going to be a gelatinous gravy, a gelatinous jus uh, reduction of basic is veal reduction and espanol is the classic term for it. But okay. it's nice. It's, it's very gelatinous. It, you don't have to thicken it. You don't have to add a roux. You don't have to add cornstarch. You have nothing to it. We're going to add this. When this reduces down, we're going to add our demi. And then we're going to finish it and we're going to monte some butter in there. We're going to use the goat butter and monte the butter in there. And that's it. Other sides we're doing with the um, beef wellington. We made some simple Yukon potato uh, palm puree uh, with milk and goat butter. You know, you make the potatoes. If you ever make mashed potatoes at home, you want to take like medium sized potatoes, skin, wash the skins, leave them on, boil them in the skin, peel the skin and then rice them. Really? That's take mashed potatoes. Um, and we're going to do some simple French carrots with some salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. and I, so at this point, I'm going to add the demi-glaze. And we're going to reduce this by half. And then we're going to finish it with butter, and that's our sauce. Salt and okay. pepper is a taste, and that's it. Oh, our mouths are watering now. <laughs> So I guess you can never, you could you ever, you can't make this at Rochambeau, right? Um, like I said, we do have the holiday time. We do. We were trying to contemplate whether we want to make it a plot du jour one day um, in the fall coming up, uh, which we probably will. We may do it like a short rib Wellington instead. Um, it was kind of hold better for us day after day. So you right. make them, you know, we'll make them for two days. We won't make it one every single day because it's so labor intensive. So if we make them for two days, using a short rib will help because it won't bleed like a regular filet will or a piece of raw piece of meat. So we're probably going to go that route, I think. So you said Rochambeau is open now outside, right? Yes, all of our restaurants are open. Rochambeau, Sonzi, Scampo, the Summer Shacks, Back Bay Social, I mean, to name wow. a few. Um, yeah, everything's open. Patios actually were legally, I, we had a private patio at Rochambeau, so we we're always open, but all the rest of the patios that, were, that we mean, we had private rather. The public ones have now opened up as effective today, actually. Um, right. You know, it's a good day in the city. Patios open up. Sporting arenas can have uh, 12%. Yeah. <laughs> Restaurants at Fenway Park. So opening day, we'll have 4,000 people in the stands, which, you know, helps our five restaurants down there. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. I guess, I guess, I guess you don't need anything to go to sleep. You're probably exhausted when you go to bed. Ah, I stay up late thinking. I send a lot of emails. My sous chef's like, why are you texting us at one in the morning? I'm up. It's hard to unwind and go to sleep. I'm sure. So I don't know if this is the end of this segment. I think we we're supposed to go till 6.15, but um, Kirsten, I wonder if Kirsten can chime in and see. Does anybody, no else, have, anybody else have any questions out there? So what I'm doing, Nick, is they're sending questions and I'm also, uh, as they're sending them, I am giving you that same question. Okay. Um, let me think, what else can we say? Um, yes, we can, uh, we can switch to um, Lauren and Gordon now, if you want to take a break and we can come back to you um, at about 6.40, 6.45. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. That was fabulous. Hi, Lauren. Hi, how are you? How are you? Good. I think we're just waiting for Gordon. Yep. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, Gordon. Um, Hi. Hi. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, which I don't think anyone really does, <laughs> um, I'm Lauren Dickerson and I'm the Vice Counsel of Food and Drink for the Department of International Trade. And I work with Kirsten, as she said earlier today. And I'm joined today by Gordon Reed, who is the president of Stop and Shop 
uh, here in the Northeast um, for the New England area. Um, Gordon has worked uh, worldwide in different retail industries and previous to Stop and Shop, he was at Giant Food and uh, he's been at Tesco and a number of other global brands. Um, so let me welcome you, Gordon, and thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. And um, I guess we'll just kick into kind of our chat. Um, so just as I said, uh, you've had a very interesting career from our conversations and it's taken you across the world. Um, how has this led you to the U.S. and how long have you been in the U.S. and more specifically been in the Boston area? Gosh, um, so my qualified as a pharmacist about a million years ago and uh, worked with Boots of Chemist in the U.K. for 15 years, then spent 15 years in Asia with uh, the S. Watson Group um, and with Tesco in sort of places like uh, Central Europe, India, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan. And then I came to the US uh, in 2013. Uh, so I was approached to come and join the Ahold group as it was at that time uh, and ran the business in the uh, Washington DC, Maryland, Virginia area for six and a half years. And I've been in Boston now for 18 months. I'm sure you've really enjoyed the, the winters here. <laughs> it's, it's been interesting. <laughs> After the first cold weekend, we, my wife and I went out and bought the thickest, warmest jackets we could possibly find. I, I, I'm originally from Michigan, so I understand the cold. Um, but so kind of in the in the retail industry, the, the grocery retail during the pandemic has been one of the most talked about issues over the last year. What were some of the main obstacles you encountered and how were you at Stop and Shop um, able to manage these issues? No, it's certainly been an interesting time. And um, <clears throat> You know, it came upon us very, very quickly in terms of the lockdowns and the other businesses closing. And obviously, as a supermarket business, we were asked to stay open as an essential service for people to, to be able to find food. And I think um, <clears throat> the biggest thing was at the start, there was no guidance at all from anyone. So we were looking at uh, how do we do this and how do we sort of keep you know, the main priority was to keep our associates and our customers safe. Um, and really, we sort of uh, had to learn really quickly, uh, you know, about customer limits, about one-way aisles, putting in plexiglass, extra sanitation, uh, you know, queuing in, in one direction, uh, and keeping one of our doors closed so we could count the number of people who were coming in and out of the store. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a really interesting time. And uh, you all know the panic. It's actually a, exactly a week, uh, you saw a year ago to... To this week where it all really took off on our last uh, Saturday, to be honest with you. And you know, a normal business doubled overnight um, and it lasted for at least three weeks in terms of the doubling of the business. And then it sort of hit a higher, it sort of settled at a much higher level with everything being closed. And as Nick mentioned, you know, restaurants were closed. Uh, it really was just supermarkets that uh, made food available. So it was a, an exciting time and a main, major challenge for the the supply chain, which I'm sure you all looked for toilet roll and household cleaner at some point, and were disappointed to find that you couldn't get it. Uh, and uh, it's something I've never witnessed. I've been all over the world and I've never witnessed anything like it. So it certainly was a, a real uh, education as we go forward. Yeah, I, I hate to admit that I was probably one of those people stockpiling <laughs> at the beginning of the <laughs> pandemic, hoarding everything that was. I could. <laughs> um, just to say, just to continue, what I think was really important for us was obviously, and I think Nick mentioned it, that we realized we were all in it together. And, uh, you know, there really was more than just uh, keeping our stores open. Uh, you know, the, the, when the first couple of weeks, you know, our stores normally closed about 10 o'clock, uh, most of the stores, and our associates weren't getting out until midnight because the queues were so long. And so we cut back on the hours. Uh, we made sure we tried to look after our people. And then obviously the communities wider were struggling. So you know, we started supplying uh, meals to some of the frontline healthcare workers in hospitals in New York and Boston and then Connecticut. And we were supplying like 5,000 meals a day to um, you know, the frontline workers, which was something that uh, you know, we were incredibly proud of and thought we were giving, at least giving back. And then supporting the food banks. You know, we support 13 food banks across our, our geography, the main player being the Greater Boston Food Bank. Uh, so we donated a million dollars to them sort of straight off. Then we brought forward our uh, fundraising campaign we do each year for the food bank and managed to donate another 1.3 million. So, you know, there's a whole myriad of things happening in communities. And 
uh, with people not working, you know, the amount of uh, food insecurity uh, skyrocketed at that time. So again, we did as much as we could to help support that. No, that, that's, that's great. Um, and thank you for doing that. Um, kind of on that, we know e-commerce technology innovation has become increasingly important over the last couple of years and more specifically during COVID. What types of innovation or innovative technology has the Stop and Shop started using in the stores and kind of in your supply chain um, to help ease everything? But then additionally, because I've heard this on some other calls, uh, I would like to learn more about your robot, Marty, who I live in New York, so I haven't been able to meet him, <laughs> but I know everyone has a, has kind of run into him and in thinking that they're, he's stalking you in the store. <laughs> so it'd be Absolutely. just great to hear more about him. A lot of rumors about Marty, that's for sure. <laughs> no, I think when the biggest challenge that we all had, and I'm sure you all experienced it, was online shopping and e-commerce just, uh, uh, you know, went through the roof. You know, we were over 120% increase in our e-commerce business last year. Um, and there was a time at this, in the first couple of months of the pandemic where, you know, people wanted to shop online, but with supply chain problems, product just wasn't available. So we were picking orders and supplying 20% of people's orders, which was a massive challenge and a massive disappointment to a lot of people. <clears throat> so we had to work incredibly hard to get that sort of uh, fixed as much as we possibly could and to inform customers what was happening. Um, and we opened up um, another 250 of our stores to have a click and collect facility. So basically, you, as well as our delivery service, we you can order at store and then go into the store and you know, we pick your order, then you come and collect it. So that's now available in uh, 375 stores. Uh, we launched Instacart in all of our stores as well. Uh, so that really, that was the big focus. Um, in our DCs, we actually trialed uh, an exoskeleton lifting suit with our... Uh, uh, associates uh, getting support. It was done with MIT. So they're developing this exoskeleton suit, which is quite interesting to watch people using it. It's, it takes about 50% reduction in the, the stress of uh, lifting. And then um, there's, we have a micro fulfillment center in one of our stores where basically it's a massive machine that takes up uh, one floor of a building and it picks, uh, it's robots that pick your order for you and bring them to you. So that's an experiment we've been working with to, to see again if we can improve our e-commerce business. And then there's finally Marty the Robot, who Marty the Robot is six foot three, I think it is, and gray uh, with big googly eyes. And he runs up and down the, the aisles of the store finding uh, spillages. Uh, and since we've implemented him or brought him in two years ago, our uh, accidents in store are down 20%. So that was the real function of the, this, the, the robot. He looks for spillages uh, and helps uh, pick those up. And there's other um, opportunities for us to use the technology that's built into Marty, something like scanning the, the shelves to look for out of stocks and to count product, um, but that hasn't been activated yet. But if anybody ever worries it's following them, it's not. It's a pre-programmed route that he follows, and then as he bumps into people or he stops, he then changes direction, so it becomes a very random issue. But the number of letters I've had from people claiming that Marty's following them around the store is uh, unbelievable. So. <clears throat> I know Kirsten was convinced Marty was following her, so I'm, <laughs> I'm sure she's glad to hear he's not. Um, and, and do you see e-commerce kind of going forward, becoming more important to stop and shop as you go forward? I feel like I've become more of an e-commerce grocery shopper, so just kind of wondering how you guys are seeing it. No, absolutely. I think it's um, going to keep growing and growing. And there's talk that it's accelerated e-commerce somewhere between our grocery e-commerce, accelerated by three to five years in terms of the development. Um, and really now it really is about just the facilities and the coverage that we have. And then there's always that question after COVID, what happens? But the, all the research shows that people who have tried e-commerce during the pandemic are keen to, to work with it and, um, or to keep going with it. And so and we, again, we're developing new technology, um, new passes that allow people to uh, book a slot and have a permanent slot. So if you join a, a Stop and Shop membership, then you'll have the ability to book a, uh, your your order when you want in the week. So that's all developments that are coming through. Oh, that's great. Um, so to kind of switch topics and kind of go more government focused, if you will, um, COP26 is happening in Scotland this year and the UK is striving to make climate conscious decisions. 
Um, what are some of the sustainability decisions that you guys have taken at Stop and Shop stores? Well, it's interesting because I mean, if you look at our energy emissions in 2020, sort of 54% uh, is on uh, just energy and running the stores. 36% uh, is due to refrigerants and 10% due to fuel. And although we will be working to sort of uh, make, move our fleet over to electric vehicles and the company are trialing in 2022, a number of vehicles on, on the road to see what that happens. But the biggest uh, opportunity is reducing energy use and we're gonna to move to renewable energies and, obviously, and also a big push on refrigerants. And I think people wouldn't really believe that was one of the biggest causes of our carbon footprint, but for most grocers, that is something. So and we've made a commitment that we'll reduce our emissions by 50% by 2030, based on scientific facts. And by 2040 to 50, we'll be carbon neutral. Awesome. Uh, well, that <laughs> actually kind of goes into my next question quite well. Um, kind of as exotic fruits and ingredients are becoming more common in, in everyday consumption, uh, do you see a trend? Do you see that trend continuing as consumers become more aware of their carbon footprint for the the food supply? So, you know, having to yeah. fly in fruits. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think obviously customers, you know, we have in the States have people from all over the world here and people, you know, look for the products that uh, that they want to buy. But in the main, you know, there's a massive move towards local and buying local and a real support for that. Um, we really don't sort of freight, uh, air freight a lot of product uh, from around the world. Most of it's in from the Americas. Um, but there is a, a massive interest in, in people looking at sustainability. And last month we launched an app called from a company called How Good. We have two sort of uh, standards in stores. In our stores, when you look at um, a product, they will have uh, what we call the guiding stars. And we give products, our own products, one, two or three stars. And those are a measure of how healthy the product is. And that goes through a really rigorous process. But we also launched last month um, from a company called How Good, which then rates um, the individual products on environmental and social criteria, which include farming practices, treatment of animals, labor conditions, and chemical use. And that sort of gives a, you know, a number of leafs, so one, two, or three leafs. And uh, an example, you know, so basically you can look up and look at products that are really environmentally friendly. And uh, again, it takes into account sort of transport and those sort of things. And one of the things that really sold me on it was when we were first talking, it was about three years ago for this company, we're walking around and they'd set up one of our stores with the guiding stars um you know logos on it as to what you know what was a good product and at that time almond milk was a big healthy kick for a lot of people and it was becoming you know seen as a really healthy product but it didn't get a uh, how good star and i said well you know tell me why and, and basically almond milk is you know massive uh, use of water to grow them most almonds are grown in california therefore it's actually not environmentally friendly. So again, if you really want to get into understanding products, and I think people will move along that way in the future, that's how good is, is you know, is quite a, a fantastic resource. And it, I guess say it talks about labor conditions and chemical use and so animal treatment. So for all those elements that you could be concerned about, it, it answers the question. No, that's great. And as an almond drink or an almond milk drinker, I didn't realize it wasn't that environmentally <laughs> great. Um, but uh, kind of speaking of consumer awareness, um, as the consumers are um, becoming more aware of the issues around food waste, are there any initiatives that Stop and Shop is taking to help mitigate the issue? No, absolutely. As I said earlier, we're sort of the biggest um, provider to all the, the food banks across mm -hmm. this uh, the, the area that we work in. Um, and so we donate you know, a lot of food to the food banks. So things that are going out of date and products. We have a product a process called Meet the Needs. So as meat's coming to the end of its life, we fr flash freeze it in the stores. And then the sort of um, uh, agencies that we work with come and, uh, and collect it. You know, we, we're affiliate with Feeding America. So again, anybody that works with us, if it's a church, we're asking them to they um, register with Feeding America and that all that product that sort of um, gets donated, gets measured and, and goes out into the community rather than it being waste. Um, you know, we've got 400 stores and a distribution centre across the, 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 the geography and um, 
five years ago, we built a digester in our uh, free time uh, facility. So that's our million square foot um, uh, DC uh, sits in free time. And they, we've put through 130,000 tons of inedible food, which sort of runs the digester, which sort of powers 50% of the uh, energy needed to run the, the DC. So that's been quite a, oh. sort of an interesting uh, activity for us. Um, and really, again, just uh, we've got a whole lot of initiatives and with the development and apps and there's companies like Flash Food who are looking at how can we actually link people up with um, with product that's going out of date, you know. Um, but a lot of our stores, they work with local food banks, local sort of uh, pantries um, to, to really donate food and try and minimise the loss. It's a challenge because if you're going to run a fresh food business, you really have to have a waste that, you know, sort of uh, if you're culling properly and your products fresh you normally have about a four to five percent um waste in in product as you sort of try and keep it as fresh as possible oh that's that's great though that you have those those community networks um so the kind of goes right along um last time we spoke uh which was a couple weeks ago you had mentioned that you were working on the healthy america the michelle obama healthy eating initiative can you just tell us more about that initiative and i think you said you were maybe on the board, if I'm remembering correctly, and how, how you're working with them? Sure, I was, when I was in DC, I was invited to join the Board of Partnership for Healthy America, which was the um, charity that uh, Michelle Obama started when she was in the White House. Um, and we've got a number of things going with them. So as a business, I hold Del Hayes of uh, committed to sort of an, you know, making public the amount of the percentage of healthy food that we sell each year. So for Stop and Shop at the moment, 57% of the food that we sell is designated as healthy. And we've set ourselves targets to improve that along with all the other Aho Del Hayes brands. So we'll be sort of announcing that and making that public each year, which is a big step forward. We're, all, we're the only retailer that really does that. And then um, you may have watched, if you watched, if you're a Netflix fan, just last week, uh, Michelle Obama launched her new program uh, called Waffles and Mochi on Netflix which really is sort of uh, PHA have the pr privilege of being the main uh, communicators and uh, you know, really working with Michelle Obama to sort of uh, make sure that everyone hears about it. Um, and so that's on, it's about sort of teaching kids where food comes from, how you can sort of look at healthy food and understand food uh, with the aim of you know, helping kids eat far more healthy. And actually it's for adults as well, to be honest with you. It's like two cartoon characters. Um, but the full focus of Partnership for Healthy America is about childhood obesity, which is one of the biggest dangers in the country. So, you know, there's a lot happening there and it's a really worthwhile um, activity. Yeah, so and I know my nieces. Waffles yeah, my, yeah my, my nieces have been loving that show and um, it's probably a good thing because I think they eat more cupcakes <laughs> than anything else. <laughs> right. So they're, they're the target audience. Um, but kind of speaking of sweets and that we all don't particularly maybe have 50% of our diet being healthy food. Um, it's been a while since you've lived in the UK because you've been everywhere. It's like some of the, the, the food that you're missing from the UK. I know you have kind of some behind you and they might be sure. sweets that you're missing, but are there, is there anything that you miss from the UK? Well, one of my main things, and it's like the, the fish and chips in Boston is far fresher than you get in Scotland. But in Scotland, we have fish and chip shops where you go along and that's all they do. And they wrap the fish up in a bit of greaseproof paper and newspaper and you take it away with you and sit outside and eat it. And there's something, you know, takes you back to your childhood really. So I miss that in some sort of ways. And then we have a whole host of things. You've got um, Iron Brew, you know, Heinz Baked Beans, Branston Pickle. Um, the biggest sellers are McVitie's Digestive Biscuits, McVitie's Hob um, Hobnobs, and of course, HP sauce, the Houses of Parliament sauce, started in the Houses of Parliament in the UK, and a whole host I, of others. So. And I think you you were saying that those, which is what's going to be my next question, of the, are those all available at Stop and Shop, or were you able to pick them up at other retail locations? So no, those are, are available, all available in Stop and Shop. We've got over, um, gosh, uh, a thousand brands in, in their international food aisle from all over the world. Um, we've got um, a number of items from from Britain as well. So, yeah. You know, uh, and I'm assuming you being, 
And I'm assuming you being uh, Scottish meant that Iron Brew had to be in the store. Iron Brew is a, <laughs> a fun fact. Iron Brew is the only country, or Scotland is the only country where Pepsi or Coca-Cola is not the number one soda in the country, as far as Iron Brew. And as the advert used to go, it's made in Scotland from girders was the advertising strap line that made it famous. Well, I'm glad I just took that question out of my quiz later. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I forgot about that, yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, that was kind of all that I had for you. If, uh, Kirsten, were there any questions that popped up in, in the chat? Hi, yes, there is a great question here um, from Jocelyn Fassett. Uh, what does Gordon see as the next wave of innovation for this world? And uh, where will the next area of customer demand be? Um, gosh, I think there's so many things happening in food at the moment. And one of the things that we're really proud of is our use of hydroponic growing for our vegetables. And that's something that's just taking off. And uh, again, it allows growth and use of limited space to sort of um, make product available. And it's almost like people talk about it beyond organic. So, you know, there's no chemicals. It's just grown in water uh, and harvested and, and, you know, really sort of healthy. Um, I mean, e-commerce continues to grow, and that's you know, the, you know, about where is that going next? You know, you've got the um, a number of retailers building big facilities with these robots. You know, using one of Ocado from the UK, uh, partnering with Kroger. Um, it's there's just so much. You know, it's hard to to really pinpoint one one issue. You know, and brick and mortar stores, like you know, we refer to as our stores will always be there because people like to shop but then again there's that mixture of what we call this omni-channel experience so you know the customer can get you know what they want where they want you know how they want um and you know whenever they want uh, and how do we make that sort of experience through the whole brand so you feel like you're shopping stopping shop no matter where you are and how you're shopping and that's just a challenge because there are different behaviors and we're learning so much, I think, especially from the last year's things have accelerated. Um, but it's a constant, it's a constant, you know, um, growth. I mean, two years ago, who would have imagined something like kombucha would be such a health drink? And that, again, it just changes and changes and changes. And people are so innovative. You know, they look at the um, Beyond Meat, for example. So, you know, sort of different kinds of proteins. Um, you look, if you go to our milk section, you mentioned almond milk before, you look now at oat milk and a whole lot of other things that are just you know coming along one thing after another and people are definitely wanting to eat healthy so I think a lot of it's driven by by health and by people wanting to to be in a better place with their diet and then you can afford to eat the beef wellington and feel really comfortable doing it <laughs> delicious beef wellington uh, another question um, as food and eating Ooh, as food and eating is so regionally driven, how does Stop and Shop manage supply chain issues state by state and regionally? So we have about eight different facilities up and down the East Coast from you know, Massachusetts down to um, down into New Jersey. Um, and most of the product goes through our Freetown you know, uh, facility. A lot of it is cross-docked and delivered from our own vehicles, so we use our vehicles as efficiently as possible to move product around. Um, in the main, every store gets a delivery every single day. Um, some stores, it's maybe you know maybe four, uh, five times a week, but the majority of stores, it's every day. Um, and we're just constantly looking for ways to, to of innovate. You know, part of the uh, just recently last year, we announced that we had a third party used to do our supply chain in, in, in the main and the warehousing and buying for us. And we've just taken that back. So the warehouses at Freetown are now completely controlled by us, which again will bring in a whole lot of efficiencies in the, the way we want to work. And we're building a big facility down in Manchester, which again will be state of the art um, with lots more robots and different things to pick the orders. Ooh, multiple Martys. That sounds fantastic. I've got a date with Marty tomorrow, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, Jane Ollahead, is it true that they have deep fried Mars bars in Scotland? It is, unfortunately. So you take one of these, you go to your fish and chips shop, and they'll sort of put it in batter and they'll deep fry it for you. Probably the most unhealthy thing that you'll ever heard of, 
And one of the reasons that Scotland's got the highest, or one of the highest heart conditions rates in the whole world, unfortunately. We need to bring that Michelle Obama per, uh, TV show over to Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. That is all the questions from the chat at the moment. All right, then. I think um, unless there's anything you, you, you wanted to kind of let us know about Stop and Shop, we can let you go and you can participate in the quiz if you'd like um, or if there's anything else you wanted to throw out there. No, Otherwise, not at all. It's a pleasure to speak to everybody and, uh, you know, being a uh, Brit myself, it's uh, great to come along and participate at the uh, British American group. So, yeah, really appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, and I hope you'll, yes. you'll take part in the quiz, which will start now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to apologize now because I feel like no one's going to get 100%. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I apologize. Um, but it's a, it's a 10 a question quiz. Uh, so just write down your answers and then um, I'll come through and tell the answers. And if you can just keep track, we're gonna trust that you don't look anything up online um, and that you're being honest about how many answers you got correctly. Um, and then we'll kind of figure out who, who got the most correct at the end and uh, we'll have prizes. Um, so if everyone has their pen and paper ready, the first question is, after whiskey, what is the UK's largest food and drink export to the United States? Um, second question. How many cups of tea does the UK drink a day? The world's first chocolate bar was made in which British city? Question four. True or false? The UK produces over 600 types of cheese. Um, question six, true or false? In 2010, an English sparkling wine, which I hope you guys have all heard of, uh, won the world's best sparkling wine. Question eight, what drink did the Royal Navy invent to prevent scurvy? In Gaelic, what does whiskey mean? And then actually this, hopefully if everyone was listening, you should all know this, uh, which grocery store? Can you purchase in the in the New England area iron brew? <laughs> so I'll just go through and give the answers and everyone can tally their answers. And drink expert in the US. The answer is gin. Uh, followed by a close second of salmon. How many cups of tea does the UK drink daily? A hundred million daily. I was shocked by that. <laughs> Didn't believe it. Um, the world's first chocolate bar was made in which British city? It was in Bristol in 1847. Um, true or false, the UK produces over 600 types of cheese. That's correct, that's true. Um, there's actually over 700 types that the UK produces. And we need to get more into Stop and Shop, so maybe <laughs> throw some <laughs> suggestions in the comment box at Stop and Shops. <laughs> Um, what is the minimum amount of time that uh, scotch must be aged in oak casks? It's three years in one day, but we'll accept three years if anyone has that. I feel wants to buy that. Um, true or false, in 2010, English sparkling wine won the world's best sparkling wine. That's true. Uh, it was actually a producer called Ridgeview. Uh, which year did the Great British Bake Off first appear on TV? That's in 2010. What drink did the Royal Navy invent to prevent scurvy? It's the gin and tonic. Um, mostly it was for the tonic. The gin just helped <laughs> uh, the taste of tonic. Uh, in Gaelic, what does whiskey mean? Someone said it. It is the water of life. And in which grocery store can you purchase iron brew? Or just steal some from his, his windowsill? It is at Stop and Shop. <laughs> um, so... Uh, by using the raising your hand function, and I realized that I wouldn't have gotten 100%. Um, did anyone get 100%? 10 out of 10? The raising the hand function or just yelling out, did anyone get nine? 
Sorry, Kristen, I ruined this for everyone. Um, anyone get eight? Um, seven? Someone's got seven in the chat. Seven. So I think if that's, if we have a seven, a six, and a five, those are our top three. <laughs> um, Ariel, I will, congratulations. You have won a $200 uh, gift voucher to Rochambeau Restaurant uh, here in Boston. Um, I have your contact details, so I will be in touch to get that to you. Um, and for our second and third place uh getters her head and huri yusufian both have six of ten ah perfect okay well for, for the both of you i will be in touch with you and you will receive a box of british goodies uh from the food is great campaign uh which has a selection of delicious british product available uh here in the united states so i will be in touch with you about that and thank you all for participating. I'm sorry it was so technical, <laughs> difficult. Um, Kirsten scared me. She's like, I only have one first place, so <laughs> you you can't let too many people <laughs> get that. <laughs> um, so congratulations, you guys, uh, for winning. Um, now uh, I'm hoping Chef Nick is back, but kind of as everyone's preparing to cook their um, their meal at home. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick suggestion as someone who represents UK products here in the US that you could pair your beef wellington with a nice glass of English sparkling wine. I have one here from Gusborn. Um, and Gusborn is available in the New England area. I don't work for them, obviously. So I'm just kind of letting you guys know. Um, it's it's a really great sparkling wine. It has some toasty pastry elements to it that really go well with the pastry casing for the Wellington. Um, they also have some um, bruised apple and uh, forest red fruit notes that complement the pink of the beef really well. And I would assume kind of go really well with it. I've never tried English sparkling with beef Wellington, but I decided to drink some English sparkling wine by myself while we cooked. So I hope other people <laughs> are having um, a, a drink with me right now. Um, if, if, oh, and thank you. Yes, I have. I, I'm not an alcoholic. I just have a lot of <laughs> booze behind me. Um, but hopefully Chef Nick and Judy are back and maybe could join me in a toast with some English sparkling um, to the beautiful beef Wellington that we have. And I can hand it back to them to finish the meal. Yep, we have some. It's actually, it's, it's great. It's light, it's crisp. We go great with the beef Wellington and the pastry. So cheers. Cheers, everyone. I'm hoping everyone's having a drink while we do this. <laughs> Over to you. So you can see beef Wellington's out of the oven. You can see it now, hopefully. Um, by rolling it out a little bit, it's nice and tight to the meat. You're gonna wanna let this rest for about 20, 30 minutes. Not to get, it's gonna get cooled down or get more room temp. But that's okay. The pastry inside will keep the, the, the meat inside will stay nice and hot from the pastry. So, so here we have some you know simple carrots sauteed, garlic, um, herbs, mashed potatoes, simple rice. We have a Wellington here. You can kind of see, you get the nice red, all the surrounding of the mushroom. It's exactly what you're looking for. I'm gonna probably be filling it down. And you can see the sauce now is very, see it's just very nappe, we call it nappe. So that means you make your sauce after you're done, you should be able to take your finger with the sauce and just go straight down and make a little indentation like that. That's the perfect consistency for any kind of steak, chicken, fish, anything really. It's called the nappe. So then we're just gonna take the sauce. Right over the beef wellington. And then you have 
uh, beef Wellington with bon puree and uh, roast carrots. That's it. <laughs> that looks absolutely delicious. Fabulous. Yeah, you can see how, you know, how it just goes all the way around. You want that mushroom all wrapped around. Um, she's in my house, New Hampshire, seacoast. <laughs> but that's kind of a perfect cook. Looks perfect. Uh, nice, medium rare. So like I said, you want to put that in there. <laughs> um, you want to let that rest. And that's rested for the last 45 minutes. And it could probably rest it a little longer if we really wanted it to. The longer you let it rest, you want to let the juices and everything kind of just calm down in your, in your steak and just relax. Because when it comes out, it's really tight. And when you slice it, it just disperses. So if you cut it right away, it's going to be great. No matter how perfect the cook is. You know, the thermometer says 118 degrees. You're excited. You cut right into that. And it's great. So you want to make sure you cook that all the way until about 100 and 15, 16, 17 degrees, right around there. Let it rest. It's going to carry over eight degrees at least. Okay. And the longer it sits, the better it's going to be. So if it sits with the minutes, that's fine. Slice it. It's perfect. And by like I said, by rolling out the pastry a little bit, you get that nice crust that you can, I don't know, you probably can't hear it, but it's still really nice and hard. So if you left it not, if you left it, um, unrolled and just kept it thick, it will puff up a little bit. You don't really want that. So that's why you kind of roll it out a little bit. So, and that's how you make beef Wellington. Fabulous. <laughs> Chef, what is the biggest mistake that people make when cooking beef Wellington? They cut it right away. They want to see. So if you go on like Instagram, you see everyone's beef Wellington shots. It's always the cut. They always want to get that and they're impatient. So beef Wellington is about patience. You have to be patient when you're cooking beef Wellington. Um, and, and, and honestly, you can be patient when you're cooking really anything, right? But especially at beef Wellington, you need to be patient. Let it rest. Let Make the meat the day before. Wrap it the day before. Let it all, take the time to make it right. It's not a dish that you can rush. So <clears throat> it's a good quality meat, tenderloin. I would only suggest tenderloin. Nothing else is going to really work. Top round, bottom round, obviously you want to do. A sirloin is not going to work. Um, they cook differently. The, uh, they're not going to be tender. You're going to cut through. It's just the mobilizations differently. You want to stay with the tenderloin. It cooks nice and even, and it's super tender. It's easy to cut through. And the other thing, too, when you're cutting it, use a serrated knife. Don't use a regular chef. If you use a regular knife, uh, regular blade, it's going to ruin your beef. It's going to squish your beef wellington. You're not really slicing like you normally slice. You actually, you're actually sawing because you're going to get through that pastry. So when you get that through that pastry and then you're going to cut through. So a serrated knife is the best way to go. Um, but just be patient. Let it come together. You'll be much happier that you did. Looks wonderful. Chef, what is your favorite dish to cook? What is the thing that you love to make? Hmm. Um, I guess my favorite, favorite things I love to cook that I love to eat would be lamb. Um, I love a good rack of lamb. It's one of my favorite things to eat. Um, I don't cook it much at home or ever at home, really. It's usually when my wife and I will go out, it's on the menu. I'm always going to order it. Um, it's one of my favorite, favorite things. Um, I love the smoke food. We have a smoker outside. So I love to smoke my chickens and ribs and things like that. But my one favorite meal would probably be lamb. Quite okay, helpful. well, now I'm starving. <laughs> it helps that I'm Greek. <laughs> that is true. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jeff. That was absolutely uh, tremendous. Um, and I would like to now introduce um, uh, one of our sponsors, uh, Morgan Lewis, uh, Peter Pound. Uh, is a partner at Morgan Lewis, and he is also the uh, vice president of the British American Business Council, just to uh, to wrap us up. Peter, over to you. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Well, let me start by just uh, echoing the thanks uh, 
to Chef Nick. That was absolutely fabulous. And um, I'm absolutely famished now. So uh, very much looking forward to tucking into supper. But definitely, as people were saying in the chat, I certainly wish I could be getting a slice of that beef Wellington. But thank you so much for um, such an engaging presentation. Uh, thank you so much to, to Judy Ackerman as well for, for uh, animating with the great questions for Chef Nick. It's uh, clear you guys are friends and it's just a, it was a wonderful back and forth. So that was great. Also like to thank um, Lauren uh, and Gordon for that great conversation. Um, it has been a, a, a weird year with COVID for, for everyone, but grocery stores uh, really have had to evolve and we got to hear today how they're also really helping on the front line. So I think that was an incredibly engaging chat uh, and, uh, and I really enjoyed it. And I'd also like just to thank uh, Kirsten for animating this evening and for, um, for really putting this presentation on with Judy. Um, they said at the beginning that this is uh, hopefully going to be the first of a number of these. And given the attendance and the enthusiasm uh, this evening, I, I certainly hope that happens. So thank you very much on behalf of uh, the British American Business Council of New England for, for everyone for participating tonight. Uh, some great quiz winners. Um, and let me just uh, close by putting in a plug for our next event. Um, we have um, undergone some change recently at Babacne, and we have uh, uh, modernized our website. So if you go to babcne.org, you'll see our clean new website uh, stream, uh, streamlined a little bit, and showing uh, a lot of uh, uh, new information, including uh, rolling out our, our new events. And our next event is coming up um, in April. It's on April 8th, Thursday, April 8th at noon. It is a program on immigration immigration under the Biden administration, an update for expats and their U.S. employers. It's being put on by babc &E members, Fragelman, Scott Fitzgerald, who's on this evening, um, will be uh, co-presenting with Vincent Lau from the Clark Lau Law Firm. Um, and so the information for signing up on that has been sent around by email. It's also on the website. So please uh, do consider joining us for that next uh, uh, event and stay tuned for more events coming from BABC and E. So um, thank you to uh, Kirsten and UK Department for International Trade for sponsoring and for uh, joining with Babacni to put this on. Um, and thank you again to everyone for participating. Have a great evening.